Nicole, you're taking us uh, again into the past and into another place with your object here, aren't you? I am, that's right. Uh, you can see my object rotating on screen now. Uh, it's a historic object, and, uh, uh, and, but I needed to bring something that I could bring in carry-on luggage on a plane, so it had to be something that would pass through an X-ray innocuously. And uh, does anyone know what that is? Yes, OK, yeah. So there it is. It's a butter pat. Uh, and it's probably late 19th century. Uh, it's from the farm that I lived on for the first nearly nine years of my life in Ireland. Uh, parts of the farm were from the, were from the 1620s. The bit we lived in was from the 1920s. This was found in the older bit. It's not from the 1620s, I don't think. I think it's probably more recent than that. Uh, but since the farm was full of all kinds of enticing objects for the young object finder, I managed to negotiate a finder's keeper's policy relatively early on. <laughs> and mostly it was rusty nails and horseshoes and things like that. Uh, but this was a bit of a prize object, finding that. So I found that on the farm and, uh, and I got to bring it to Australia when we moved here in 1972 and uh, my mother went into labour with me on a tractor ploughing a field within metres of where that object had been I'm lost. I'm a bit scared of how the butter pat fits into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Proximity only. <laughs> so, yeah, this was in, in one of the old farm buildings um, just near there and, you know, I can't bring the tractor so I've just got the butter pat. Um, and, um, she, she, she is a doctor. Um, she didn't plough fields a lot of the time, but she ploughed fields some of the time. And this is kind of how my parents worked there. And she was a doctor. My father was a management consultant, uh, but they bred pigs and we grew barley in the fields. And so the farm was always quite a, uh, quite a part of things. And Dad went on from that to do a PhD in IT and things, having started life working in the family linen business. So, you know, there were a lot of big transitions there, but but this is kind of where I started out and where, uh, and where we started out. And uh, that's me with my father and grandfather in the lane approaching our farm. You know, I was a couple of years old then, maybe. Uh, obviously still in nappies, or they really bought me very oversized shorts. Um, <laughs> my grandfather always dressed like that. That's him relaxed on a weekend. So there we are, walking up the lane to our farm. There's barley growing in those fields. In the distance, you'll see uh, the spire of a church. That's Carador Church, where the poet Louis McNeese was buried a matter of days before my mother went into labour ploughing that field. And W.H. Auden gave the address at his memorial mm -hmm. service and uh, Seamus Heaney turned up shortly after he was buried with other Irish poets of the up-and-coming generation to visit Louis McNeese's grave wow. and all agreed to write an elegy. And so there are several poems about the churchyard that were written within months of me being, being born there. So that's kind of, that all feels like that's sort of part of my story too. But that farm that we were on is sort of a, and the butter pat that I found there is a link back to the farms of Earl's families of previous generations there. That's my family in 1890. If you wanted to have fun, you would find those people, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's, it's just look at them. So it really looks like, surely there's like a firing squad set up just out of shot. They don't look like a particularly happy family. So the gentleman at the back is actually much younger than he looks. There, That's James, my great-great-grandfather. The joyful woman in front of him sitting is Maggie, my great-great-grandmother. Uh, they owned a farm. That's the gates of their farm. Very characteristic Ulster gatepost on a farm there. Like my parents, they did other things as well. My great-great-grandfather was a school principal. My great-great-grandmother was a school teacher and uh, he actually employed her at the school uh, and then married her back when it was cool to hire people and then marry them. Um, <laughs> not, not as encouraged these days, but quite okay in the 1860s apparently. My great-grandfather did the same thing. Yeah, so it's all fine, really, all fine. So there they were teaching in school and they had, they had eight children and two of their sons and two of their daughters became teachers too. And that was kind of part of the family as well. So we owned farms but it was really important to get an education and it didn't matter what gender you were, you were expected to get one and to have some kind of career. Uh, so for 150 years the women in my family have spent as much time at universities as the men and that was a great family to grow up in where that was just where reading and education was normal and you would go out and you would do things and occasionally you would 
as my mother did, get a medical degree but plough a field while being nine <laughs> months pregnant and, uh, and all that. Um, and so I've had that photo since I was quite young. And there was always a sort of hint of a story to it. There's always a story that a member of that family had come to Australia and gone missing. And when we came to Australia, that was an interesting thing because I thought, not the first one who's been here. But, uh, uh, and my understanding was it was the guy on the left, on the far left of that photo, uh, I thought he was my great, great uncle Robert. Uh, and that he, and the story, family story was that Robert had come here He'd been to South Africa first, then back to Northern Ireland, and then he'd come here in about 1910 and had disappeared. And that was all we knew. But my father's cousin, in about 1950 or so, decided to start looking for it. And he interviewed Robert's remaining sibling, Anne, who is the young girl on the right there, talked to her, found out quite a bit about him as a young man, but no details. So he was still missing, but my father's cousin kept trying to track him down for a long time, and for years, and got nowhere. Drew Blanks. There were lots of other people called Earls in Australia, but they were from Galway or Clare, and they're the descendants of Norman Earls, as in men with that title, who had extramarital relations when they were <laughs> stationed in Ireland, whereas our name comes from Arles in France. Completely different thing. <laughs> so they weren't related to us. Uh, but then New South Wales put its death records for the first part of the 20th century online in 2001, and there was a Robert Earls who died in 1926. And so Chris, my father's cousin, thought, can this possibly be our guy? And got, got details of the, of the man's parents and thought, this is him. How do, I get, how do I get these records? How do I find out what's happened to my ancestor? And uh, he found the shire that, uh, that, the, the record that, he, that he died in. He wrote to the health people there and said, I don't suppose there's any records because you know, it's 75 years now since he died. Uh, and they said, we've got a whole file, uh, but we can only release them in person and we can only release them to the next of kin. And, and Chris was a professor in California, so it wasn't going to be easy for him. But he worked out that if they, if they applied male primogeniture, uh, uh, then my dad was the next of kin. And my dad was coming to Canberra on business shortly after that. So my dad could go to Goulburn and get the files. So he got the files, and we finally found what happened to, to my great-great-uncle. And, uh, and the files, massive amounts of detail. And here is here's a crucial one. There is the bit of paper that really has the crucial information on it. It's from Wagga Wagga. Uh, as you can see at the top, Lunacy Act of 1898. That's his regulation when um, things went wrong for him in 1910. And as you read through that, uh, he was schizophrenic. Uh, and they, that term was not in use at the time. They had advanced enough to call it dementia precox. It was kind of the early stages of it having its own designation. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this big medical file and you read through it and you see the tough times that he had when he got lost and went, and then the times when things were functioning better. And you see some compassion there, uh, but also lots of hosing, hosing downs for uh, precocious <laughs> masturbation and those sorts of things as well. Uh, they didn't handle all that very well. Uh, but then they also found this. And that is a letter from my great-grandfather, uh, a detailed letter written in, the 19, in 1922, I think, from the top there, when my great-grandfather was a professor of mathematics in Belfast uh, and writing, giving family history and all kinds of detail and sending some money. Uh, so the family knew, but because of what had happened, they kept it to, them, to themselves. Mm and nothing was ever said about it. So my father didn't get to find out. And um, eventually, we did get to find out. And I, so I wanted to kind of acknowledge that and make more of that in the way I would, and all I write is fiction, so I thought I want to find a story that I can embed that kind of story in. And I had another ancestor who had briefly been to, to Ballarat, and, uh, uh, and so I thought it's going to be a gold rush. I'm going to send to contemporary people a father and son, not a young father and son, a nearly 80-year-old father and a 50-ish year old son to Alaska, to, to see if they can track down the, what happened to an ancestor who went missing from that family photo. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I was about to go to Alaska for my 50th birthday, and I thought, 
I'm going to set it in Skagway because Skagway is such a cool name. <laughs> I'm going to call it Skagway. So I did lots of research for Skagway and then discovered we weren't going to Skagway. <laughs> so, so it ended up as Juno uh, and, and Juno delivered. So I had an awesome glacier hike on Juno, which was great. But the rest of the time I ran around Juno finding everything I possibly could to go with this story. And, um, and seeing all the relevant things in Juno, like this Russian church built in 1894. The guy in the story would have been there just after that, so it would have been a new building then. I thought, got to see that. So I did all that and created this character, Thomas Chandler, who had gone missing in the 1890s, and they're there to find his story. And, uh, and so I think it's great that I get to come here today in the month of release of this story when my ancestor lived and died sort of in Wagga Wagga, Goulburn, and really just down the road from here. And there he was, missing for all those years, and now we know where he is, and he's just kind of in this neighbourhood. So it felt very nice to be able to turn up with this object that kind of links me back to him at a time when I'm coming here for this. And it was only in the course of, uh, of doing the research that I discovered that the person in the photo who I thought was him was actually one of his other brothers. And the two people missing from the photo are my great grandfather father and the, the great great uncle who went missing and the one who I thought was him is actually called Thomas which coincidentally was the name I gave the character in the story. Mm. Mm. Coincidentally? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know you'd done it. <laughs> <laughs> I know now that I'd done it yeah. but I was pretty sure that was Robert. What, so, what I love about this is that you know you found these records online originally that it's the digitisation of the New South Wales yeah. dec death records yeah. and you know as a museum and the National Library does this as well we digitise a lot of our collections so people can look for their family histories. A family history is the third most popular activity on the web, they say, after shopping and of course, pornography. Um. <laughs> and a large part of that is my family. <laughs> <laughs> two out of three, right? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're big on two out of three of those things. <laughs> um. You can decide which two. Yeah. So, uh, and and it, what you say is very interesting because in the process of constructing the fiction around this, I had to do the Alaskan version of it. So I got to read the Alaska Vitals, which are online, uh, which have all these records, and discover what would have happened to you in Alaska at the time, and uh, what you can do. What you can do now. It's one of the great things about being a writer in this century is there's so much you can discover without actually being there. Now I got to go to Juneau, which was great. And, you know, tax deductible, I wrote a book. So that's cool. <laughs> but, but when I got back from Juno, then I could actually spend much more time going around the streets of Juno on Google Street View and, and getting mm. in loads of detail uh, and discovering what the researcher would have discovered and, and really building on the story so that, so that what I hope is that here's this piece of fiction that Im embedded in it has large parts of my great-grandfather's actual letter, but a fictional Alaskan story that is informed by huge amounts of actual fact from exactly those sorts of sources. If you could join me in thanking our, our guests today.